I'm Pastor Dan Beamlander, and you might wonder, well, where's Pastor Greg, and what's going on here, and is this guy one of the prophets of old? You know, watch what you say there, I might not return. All right. Well, we rejoice as God's people from these scripture readings reminding us that no matter what happens, the word of Jesus, his work continues to go on. It does not stop. You know, when we were planning to come here, I checked with Pastor Greg, okay, do you have easy, easy time finding fill-ins when you're gone? And he said, no, and that's the case I've usually had too. Finding someone to fill in for a vacation or time to go is not so easy. And I, and I foolishly said, well, I'll fill in for you. But as we do, and looking at it, and then the scriptures came up. I don't know about how your life has been the past few years, but in our family, we've had a fair amount of just wonderful times, but also loss of some dear family members and friends colleagues I've known who either graduated or worked with me. And then comes the scripture readings, and it's about the death of John the Baptist. But it's a reminder, as Jesus is preaching, and as Jesus' work is being done, it's a reminder Jesus came to help us because death and sin is in this world. And that word must never stop. But maybe sometimes you have asked why things happen. So a story from some years ago, it says, called, the sound was deafening. Although no one was near enough to hear it, it ultimately echoed around the world. None of the passengers in the DC-4 ever knew what happened. They died instantly. This was February 15th of 1947. The Avianca airline flight bound for Quito, Ecuador, crashed clumsily into the 14,000-foot-high towering peak of El Tablazo, not far from Bogota. Then it dropped, a flaming mass of metal, into a ravine far below. A young New Yorker, Glenn Chambers, was one of its victims. He planned to begin a ministry with the voice of the Andes, a lifelong dream that suddenly aborted into a nightmare. Before leaving the Miami airport earlier that day, Chambers hurriedly dashed off a note to his mom on a piece of paper he found on the floor of the terminal. The scrap of paper was once a printed piece of advertisement with the single word, why, sprawled across the center. But between the mailing and the delivery of that note, Chambers was killed. When the letter did arrive, there staring up at his mom was the haunting question, why? Of all the questions, it is the most searching, the most tormenting. No single truth removes the need to ask why, like this one. Well, here it is, what he had written. God is too kind to do anything cruel, too wise to make a mistake, too deep to explain himself. Mrs. Chambers stopped asking why when she saw the who behind the scene. All other sounds are muffled when we claim his absolute sovereignty, even the deafening sound of a crashing DC-4. And so why do we gather this day? Because we need to hear again that though death is around, there is life and hope and salvation in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, as he was teaching and preaching and the wonders go out, this word is heard and Herod wonders, is John the Baptist raised from the dead? And we realize now why, from our readings, we know why John was in trouble. He had been speaking about how sin is in this world. He was preaching and it caused him to be bound in prison. He spoke plainly God's word that Herod's marriage to his brother's wife was not right. And Herodias, that wife, had a grudge against him as the scriptures say, just be quiet about it, John, you're causing trouble because Herod likes you. Herodias wanted John the Baptist put to death to silence all this discussion. 
And now think about that today as the word of God is proclaimed. When we speak, maybe not just about divorce, but about the other sexual issues of the day that come up, and some we know are in conflict with God's word. And the church, we pastors and you as people, we have to speak about those things. We still speak in love, but we speak about God's word, and that doesn't always go well with family and friends, with rulers, with society, and all the views out there. And in some of the nations of the world, you read some scriptures, you get in trouble because they speak about some of the things happening. And people, well, you can have grudges against God's word, against people today, and want to stop things that disturb us. Are you holding a grudge against someone, family or friend, someone in the church, this world, we realize, boy, that's part of our sinful nature and enters in quite easily. And maybe others hold grudges against us. But even with those things happening, with John gone, the work goes on. Jesus is proclaiming the word, and that's why Herod wonders what's going on. There's a whole lot of preaching being done. There are miracles. There are healings. This is where we see indeed as God has been with his people. Nazareth, his hometown, wants him to leave. He does healing yet in God's word. And now King Herod is wondering, and others, who is he? And what is he about? Is he John the Baptist raised from the dead? Is Elijah one of the other prophets? More and more people wanting to know because they noticed Jesus was bringing difference into their lives, just as John the Baptist was. And remember what John the Baptist came for? He came to prepare things for Jesus, the one who would die for our sins and bring us hope and life. And you and I today are filled with the Holy Spirit and we're gathered in knowing that God guides us as his people sometimes in very difficult circumstances. A number of years ago, a teenage girl from West Africa reminded a Lutheran pastor in the U.S. what it means to trust Jesus. The 14-year-old girl with her Muslim family had moved from Africa to the U.S., but she had been attending a Lutheran congregation that reaches out especially to African immigrants. One night, she visited the pastor of the congregation to tell him that her parents, who'd been in Africa for a time, were returning to the U.S. within a week. They were strict Muslims. She said to the pastor, I won't be able to come back here until I am 18. Her parents would not allow it while she was underage. So the 14-year-old girl asked for a Bible. She planned to read it in secret. She had not yet been baptized. Even though it was risky, she believed in Jesus as her Savior and Lord. She trusted Jesus so much that she was willing to put herself in danger to learn more about him. And we realize, isn't that the call of God's word? We know our sins and we know the struggles we have and we hear the wonders that Jesus has done, that he risked death, his followers risked death, in order to speak about Jesus coming to be the Savior of the whole world. And so we see in the midst of sin, Jesus' work still goes on, his word goes out, death will not stop it when he hears of John the Baptist beheading. Mark doesn't include it in this gospel, but in Matthew, you see, when Jesus hears he's been taking care of people and he and the disciples need to go away to pray for a while. Sometimes when you get hit by these heavy things of life and especially death, you need some time away. Well, as they went for the time away and the crowds followed, there was no time to be away. So he continued to preach and teach and feed the 5,000 and their families. And God's work was done. And then he had to pray, had time to pray and find hope in God's word. We might be busy and heavy laden with a whole lot of things, but no 
Jesus is always ready and he never tires out. I don't know, do you tire out sometimes from all the things you got to do in this world? Yeah. And we think of Herod now. Think how the word of the Lord was touching Herod. He was perplexed by what John had to say, and yet he wanted to hear him. And now it's his birthday and a wonderful party, and there's a dance, and then that vow. And don't you remember from your catechism teachings, you be careful if you go beyond yes or no. Make your wedding vows, make your vow confirmation vows. Watch out what you say beyond that, because you might just have to. As Deb and her sister Carolyn and I were rather foolish and said, well, Greg and Jill, and the kids are going to be gone. We'll paint that bedroom. Oh, well, foolish things are done by people. And it's mostly done. We just have, well, the room's done. We just have to move some more things. But we'll probably have to think twice or three times before we offer that again. But we probably still will. You got to help out family and friend. But here Herod asks, or here's that request, Herodias finally gets her way, because sometimes people, evil people of this world, get their way, and it hurts God-believing people. And here it takes the life of John. And knowing he must do it, this must be done. Herod can't break his word, and that's how I, Herodias, asks, immediately and at once, I want the head of John on this platter. Well, Jesus knows what he's going to have to deal with. He's already been dealing with family and friend and the Jewish authorities who don't think he's a prophet, wonder what's going on. And then he'll be under the Roman government and Pontius Pilate knows he's innocent, but because of the will of the people and the political pressures, okay, Jesus must go to death. And because of that, and his resurrection, we never forget about that. We go on with life, knowing and confessing what Christ Jesus has done, how he faces that suffering and death so that we can face the things that happen. He's raised from the dead the greatest miracle at all that brings forgiveness of life to all. And so there's hope put in our lives about what may be. Story from many years ago, William Allen Wright in his autobiography, wrote of a boyhood friend and playmate, Temple Friend, who was kidnapped by the Indians when about one year of age. Temple's grandfather was a, an itinerant missionary to the Indians. He persisted in his faith that his grandson was alive. Coming to an Indian village, he made it a practice to line up all the boys near the age of his grandson whispering quietly in the ear of each boy so as not to startle him, he repeated the name of his grandson, Temple, Temple. Time went by and his face seemed hopeless. About eight years later, eight years, so when one of your prayers isn't getting answered in the week or a year, sometimes they take longer. About eight years later, he came to an Indian village remotely situated from his usual circuit. There were about a dozen boys, eight to ten years of age, gathering them together as he had done many times before. He once more whispered in the ear of each boy the name of his grandson, Temple. At the middle of the line, one boy's face lighted up suddenly, and he responded, Me, Temple. No explanation can be satisfactorily given as to how, across the intervening years since his kidnapping, at such an early age, this boy retained the memory of a name long unheard. But the story reveals both the capacity of a heart to remember a heritage and the persistent search love makes for its own. And so Jesus keeps searching out to bring us home to him. And God allows the things to be in our lives. And his work is never stopped, not by people who hold a grudge, not by any government, but the almighty power of God brings his mercy, his grace to us. Because in the midst of our suffering and pain and death, in the midst of the struggle we have with sin and the devil, Jesus' word 
still comes to us to bring us a reminder. Our sins are forgiven in him, and we've got an earthly home with him. Ephesians reminded us of that this morning. Before all time, he predestined us to be his people. And so whatever happens in life, know you are a child of God. And he's longing to bring you home, but we've still got work while we're still here in this world. That we and all believers in Christ might bring hope in the name of Jesus that sin is forgiven, death is defeated, and at the last day we're going to be raised and gathered together all as his people. And so we pray for that strength in between whatever years we have left in this world or before the Lord's coming, that Jesus' work does not stop and that many, many more people believe. May God be with you and may you always know his love and mercy. Any struggle you're happening as that is happening for you or that is happening in my life, our family's life, we pray we raise them all to Jesus and trust he's going to take care of us through all these days. So let us indeed continue in our worship and rejoice that Jesus' work does not stop. He's continuing to be with us, with your congregation here, and with many other believers throughout this world, speaking the word of hope and resurrection in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.